Welcome to this edition of Ask an Astronomer. I am your host, Dara Dwayne, and I have our in-house astronomers with me, Mary Hiller and Kevin Kanad. And um, we have some cool uh, things we're going to explore today. Um, but before we jump into that, I just want to remind all of our viewers at home that if you have any questions that you would like to ask our astronomers, ergo it is Ask an Astronomer Live, please drop those questions into our comments section. So if you're watching us via Zoom, there's a comment section, a Q&A section, where you can drop in any questions you may have um, for our astronomers at any point during during our presentation today. And for those who are watching at home on Facebook Live, please leave your comments in our Facebook comments. We will be sure to get to those questions as well. And of course, any questions we don't manage to get to through uh, on this episode, we will definitely double back on the following episode, which I believe is May 19th. Um, we will uh, explore those questions that we don't get to on this episode. So by all means, don't feel slighted if we don't get to you. We just got a lot of questions coming in, all right? Um, so I'm going to pass the baton over to Kevin and Mary in a second. Uh, ultimately, they're going to be talking about uh, exploration of planets outside of our solar system. So I'm very excited because I've always wondered if it was possible to live on another planet. Is there another planet Earth? Um, you know, what are the range of possibilities? So they're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that. Um, so I'm not sure who wants to take it first, Kevin or Mary, but it's up to you. The floor is up to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, uh, I guess we could uh, put up our, our slides here and start talking about the uh, extrasolar planets here. Um, by the way, uh, we had a question recently from Elena from Bergenfield, if I remember correctly, uh, and she asked about exosolar planets, and sure enough, that's actually our topic today, so we're going to answer, hopefully answer all of her questions. I hope she's online uh, right now with us. Uh, but uh, if we go to the, uh, the next slide, we'll talk about what is an, ex uh, what is an exoplanet. Uh, exoplanet um, is just a short way of saying extrasolar planet. In other words, planets that are beyond our solar system. These are stars that are orbiting uh, other planets. And, you know, boy, we've been wondering about this for almost 400 years. We wanted to know, are there other planets orbiting these other stars that we see in the nighttime sky? And sure enough, we are finally fi finding uh, many of them. So let's go to the uh, next slide here and let's uh, kind of break down uh, the exoplanets by the numbers. Uh, at this point, we have over 4,000 exoplanets uh, confirmed. Uh, this is about 1995 was kind of when the floodgates opened. We had new techniques available to us and larger telescopes, better telescopes. And so uh, we've discovered more than 4,000. These planets uh, exist in 3,000 solar systems in our neighborhood. Uh, most of the ones that we have found are uh, within 2,500 light years uh, of the sun. And uh, NASA has another 5,000 waiting in the, ring, in the wings here. Uh, there are 5,000 more of them, objects that we think are exoplanets but haven't yet been confirmed. And so I really have to, we have got to sort through the, a lot of data in order to figure out whether or not these are, are really are planets or not. And so, boy, there are a lot of planets out there. And uh, so we're going to show you a, a few of these, uh, a few examples uh, here very shortly. Uh, but let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, here, there are two things that you need to keep in mind about exoplanets. Uh, Earth-sized is not the same as Earth-like. We find this mistake over and over again. Unfortunately, the media makes this mistake a lot of times. And even sometimes astronomers uh, get a little carried away sometimes and they use these words interchangeably. Uh, but they aren't really. Remember that uh, a planet that is the size of the Earth is not necessarily uh, Earth-like. And we have a really good example in our solar system. And so if we go to the next slide, let's look at the, the, some of the planets here in our inner solar system. You got Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Earth. And as you can see, both Earth and Venus are very similar in size. Venus is just a little bit smaller. And the composition of these planets are pretty similar. They're rocky planets or so-called terrestrial type planets. Uh, but Earth and Venus are really quite, quite different. Um, you know, uh, you can go and spend a nice uh, hot day uh, on, the, on the beach uh, enjoying some sunshine. But if you do that on, on Venus, you would die within a few seconds. <laughs> so it's not really a very Earth-like uh, place. Uh, it's not a place you'd want to go on vacation. Uh, you know, so it is really quite different, even though the distance is similar and the composition is similar. It's a very, very different planet, even though the sizes are very similar. So just keep in mind, Earth size is not the same as Earth-like. Uh, another very important concept when we're talking about exoplanets, let's go to the next slide here. Let's take a look 
at uh, the habitable zone. Maybe you've heard of this. Um, uh, people talk about the habitable zone. Well, what does that mean? Well, you've got uh, planets that are uh, that are close to uh, their sun, and uh, they're very hot. They're so hot that liquid water cannot exist. It's either vapor or maybe may not exist at all. Uh, other planets are too far away from the sun, so you see this kind of blue zone here uh, out to the edge of the solar system where it's very, very cold, where water can uh, mostly exist as a solid, as ice. Uh, so that's not very uh, particularly good for, for life. But in this sort of green zone here, this is the habitable zone. This is the kind of Goldilocks zone. This is where the temperatures are not too hot, not too cold. It's just right. And so that's where the Earth is. And so that's what we look for in other solar systems. If we want to find another Earth out there, we ought to look in this habitable zone. Okay. So um, let's take a look at um, some really interesting and bizarre worlds that we have found out there in our neighborhood. So if we go on to the next slide here, let's take a look at uh, 51 Pegasi, uh, interesting star in the constellation Pegasus. Uh, this is Domitium. Uh, this is one of the first exoplanets uh, found and one of the first that we know of uh, orbiting a sun-like star way back in 1995. And uh, so uh, this was a, a very important uh, discovery and people were very excited about this. And it's a really good example of a very common planet. We like to call them hot Jupiters uh, because they're big and gaseous like Jupiter but they're really close to their sun, and so they're incredibly hot. So that's why we call them hot Jupiters. And we find these um, very close to their sun's uh, Domitium is only about 5 million miles away from its star, which is closer than Mercury is in our own solar system. So that's tremendously close, and so really quite amazing. We're not expecting to find something like this, and yet here it is. And we've found a lot of them out there in the solar system, very easy for us to detect. Uh, let's go on to the uh, next uh, uh, next slide here. Uh, this is Kepler 186f. This is the first Earth-sized planets found in a, in a habitable, habitable zone. Uh, very interesting uh, system. Uh, by the way, um, as we're going through these uh, images of extrasolar planets, keep in mind that these are all artist rendition. If it's not obvious, these are artist renditions of what these planets might look like because in many cases, we don't really have images. We know our telescopes are not good enough to give us images of the surfaces, not, not yet anyway. Uh, so a lot of that exists in the form of data, which you, know, you get a table of numbers, that's maybe not very interesting, but we turn this information over to some artists and they can create a nice visualization of what it might look like. Uh, that being said, uh, this uh, particular one, as we said, is an Earth-sized. Uh, it's a slightly larger, about 11% larger than Earth is. And uh, we're not really sure whether this is a rocky planet. The artist here has given us a, a rocky planet. Uh, but it could be also a water world. It could be completely covered by water. We're not really sure. And we're not really sure what its atmosphere is like either. Uh, this is um, not close by to us, so there's some unknowns about it. About 600 light years away from us in the constellation Cygnus. So uh, interesting world. Let's move on to something a little bit more exotic. Uh, here's uh, Gliese 8876d. Uh, this was the, one of the first super Earths to be discovered. This was a surprise for us as well. Uh, of course, we do find some uh, planets that are like the Earth, only quite a bit bigger, uh, but we weren't really expecting to find anything like this. So some of them are so big, they might be more like the planet Neptune rather than the Earth, but they have a wide range of um, sizes. And uh, so uh, this is, uh, we think is a, a rocky world. Uh, it's about seven times more massive than the Earth. You've got an extra large Earth-sized planet. Unfortunately, it's probably not likely to be habitable. It's only three million miles from its uh, sun, uh, and it's so close that it's years, only two days long. That's how close it is. And so therefore, its temperature is probably molten. You can see the, the artist's rendition here is kind of glowing uh, because the surface is about 650 degrees or so. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good example, though, of a super Earth. Uh, let's move on to something even more bizarre. Uh, on the next slide, we will see 55 Cancri E otherwise known as Janssen. 
Uh, and uh, this is named after a Dutch uh, lens maker. It's another super Earth, about eight times bigger than the Earth. Uh, this created quite a stir when it was first uh, discovered. Uh, it was thought to be uh, uh, partly made, or, or quite a bit of it is made of carbon, which is unusual, much more than a, a planet like the Earth. Uh, and it does seem to have an atmosphere, hydrogen and helium. Uh, but like the previous planet, it's orbiting so close that its surface is extremely hot. Extremely hot. We're talking 4,000 degrees uh, at the surface. So again, not a good place for a uh, summer vacation. Uh, the pressures and the temperatures here are high enough that graphite and diamonds probably exist at the surface or near the surface. And so that's why it's sometimes nicknamed the diamond planet. So a very interesting and bizarre world. Uh, let's move on. You know, we just uh, celebrated uh, Star Wars Day uh, yesterday. May the fourth be with you. Uh, uh, this is a, a planet that is nicknamed Tatooine. Uh, this is Kepler 16b. Uh, this is one of the first planets to be found orbiting a binary star. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, just like the planet uh, Tatooine in the Star Wars movies, where Luke Skywalker grew up. Uh, on the planet with two suns. And so it's kind of amazing to think of that, uh, living on a planet in a system like this where you get two sunrises and two sunsets and they might be even different colors like this particular uh, system. We weren't really sure whether or not planets could form in multi-star systems like this. And it uh, turns out it's, it's pretty common. So something else that we've uh, learned uh, just recently in the last few years. Uh, let's go on to a, another solar system, a solar system that has quite a lot of planets in it. Uh, this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, this discovery made a, a big slash, a splash in the news because there are seven rocky planets uh, in this uh, system. And three of them, uh, perhaps even four, might be in the habitable zone of this uh, system. And because there are seven, seven of them, they're sometimes referred to as the seven dwarfs. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, but uh, it is an interesting uh, solar system, very bizarre, very different from our own. All seven of these planets are packed so close to the sun that in our system, they would fit inside the, planet, the, the orbit of the planet Mercury. So they are really packed close together to their sun. Uh, because they're so close, um, they might be in the habitable zone, but they may not be a a habitable after all because many of these stars that we find close to us are red dwarf stars. And those stars are kind of, they're small, but they're kind of angry. Uh, they put out a lot of radiation. And so uh, uh, they have a lot of flares and eruptions and things like that. And so uh, uh, it'd be tough for, for life to perhaps uh, start on a world like this, or one of these worlds anyway. Uh, which kind of brings us to uh, a question that was asked uh, last time. Uh, there was a question uh, about habitable worlds. So let's go on to the next uh, slide here. Uh, the question was, what is the closest habitable planet that could have intelligent life? And so let's go on and talk a little bit about the Alpha Centauri star system. Uh, this is a three star system. Uh, and uh, the star that's closest to us in this system, Proxima, this is the closest solar system to uh, our own sun. This is only about 4.3 light years away from us. And uh, so it's, a, a, again, a, a red dwarf star uh, uh, orbiting our two planets. You've got both B, uh, B and C. Uh, B is the smaller one there, about 1.3 times the mass of the Earth. So pretty similar uh, in size to the Earth. Uh, it is in the habitable zone. Uh, the, and it might be Earth size, so it's possible that there might be liquid water on the surface. We haven't detected that yet. Uh, but it is close, and as mentioned, this is a red dwarf star, so there might be a lot of radiation, so we're not sure if, if it's really, uh, if life could really exist there, but it's, it's possible. It's an interesting place to look. It's right in our neighborhood, only four light years away. And just a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, uh, astronomers announced that they think they found the outer planet. The larger one here you see is, is Proxima C. It's about eight times more massive than the Earth, so perhaps a, a super Earth. And uh, so this is a really inter interesting system that's uh, really right in our neighborhood that we could look for uh, signs of life. Uh, so uh, let's go on to a uh, star that's a little further out. This is uh, Kepler 1649C. 
uh, you know, is there something out there that is more like the Earth, that is kind of an Earth twin? That's something that we really would like to find, is, uh, is an Earth-like planet where intelligent life uh, might exist that would be really fascinating to find. Uh, so this is something that was, uh, again, a couple of weeks ago was uh, announced. Uh, they discovered this uh, Kepler planet, Kepler 1649c, discovered by the Kepler uh, Space Telescope. It is six to eight times more massive than the Earth, so another uh, super Earth. Uh, and so it's um, uh, probably in similar temperature to Earth, uh, but it is about 300 light years away. So not in our neighborhood, but um, you know, uh, it's uh, somewhat close to us anyway. Um, so uh, let's take a look at here. I've got a, a, a nice chart that someone uh, created. I think the Planetary Society maybe created this little chart to showing you some of the exoplanets that exist in habitable zones and how far they are uh, from the, uh, from our own sun. And so the upper left-hand corner, you've got Proxima Centauri B, uh, and you've got other ones, a couple of them that we had uh, mentioned, Kepler-186, the Tra Trappist system is mentioned here. Uh, some of them are only 12, 14, 20 light years away from us, and some are a bit further out, five, 600 light years away. Uh, the one we just mentioned was 300. So there's lots of places we can look for uh, possibilities of an intelligent life uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, so that question we really can't answer uh, right now, you know, is what is the closest intelligent life? We, we, we don't know. We have, we have not found yet. We have not found an exact twin to Earth, an Earth 2.0, and sometimes NASA refers it to, <laughs> yeah. to it. Uh, we haven't found that yet. Uh, so we really can't say, but we're looking and we're finding new stuff all the time. And this is really a, a, a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, one thing to uh, keep in mind, if you go to the next slide, if we look at our own solar system, uh, we find a lot of gas giant planets in, in our solar system and other solar systems. Uh, this is uh, not a great place to uh, look for life because as you probably know, they don't have any solid surfaces and their atmospheres are, can be very high pressure and some, some of them are not, maybe the gases there are maybe not favorable for, for life. but what about the moons? Uh, let's go to the next slide and take a look at Europa, uh, one of the biggest moons of Jupiter. Uh, this is a really nice shot that shows the surface of Europa completely covered by ice, but underneath that ice, there's a vast ocean of water. And so even though it's outside the habitable zone, uh, the interior is quite warm uh, due to the core of it and also the gravitational pull of Jupiter can keep this really quite warm. And so this is a really good place to look uh, for life, even though it's not in the habitable zone. And so maybe we could look for exomoons uh, around some of these uh, other uh, gas giants in the solar system around us. Maybe those are good, that's a good place to look for life. And hopefully NASA will send a probe to this, uh, the Europa, I forget what they're calling it. Do you remember Mary's a Europa Clipper? That's one of the names they used in the past. But, uh, it's one of these in the past. I'm not sure if they've renamed it to something else at this point. Yeah, yeah, I kind of forget what they, they changed their minds a couple of times, uh, but uh, there hopefully is a mission that will be going to Europa sometime in the next few uh, few years, and so uh, so that's a good place to look for life as well. By the way, uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, I just wanted to list a couple of names of some of these exosolar planets, exoplanets. Uh, these catalog numbers sometimes can be very bewildering, even to astronomers. You get a big long string of numbers. Uh, fortunately, the International Astronomical Union has been naming some of these, giving them proper names, which is nice, and the public has had, had some uh, input on them. Uh, Domidium. Domidium is just simply is from Latin, meaning half because this planet is half the size of Jupiter. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, characters from a, uh, uh, from a Thai legend, a folklore, uh, Amaratu, named after the Japanese uh, uh, sun goddess. Uh, Dopir is a region in Sengal. Um, Mets Metzli is an Aztec moon god, uh, and so on. So there's, got, there's some very interesting uh, names for, for some of these, these worlds. 
Uh, so you can check some of those out. In fact, uh, if we go to the next slide here, I believe I've got some websites. Yeah, uh, the uh, NASA websites uh, are good. The exoplanets.nasa.gov has lots of information about uh, new discoveries and has an updated list of, of uh, discovered uh, planets. Uh, also, there's the Extrasolar Planets Encyclopedia, which is I find very useful because you can look at that database and you can sort them, uh, sort the big table of information. You can look for the biggest, you can look for the smallest, and that sort of thing. Uh, it's very, uh, a very nice uh, European uh, website to, to check out as well. Uh, so, uh, there's uh, the exoplanets uh, uh, in a uh, nutshell here. Um, and uh, we did have a couple of um, questions from uh, last time that we did ask an astronomer. We wanted to address uh, this question, especially. I don't know if you've heard this, uh, Mary, though. Uh, uh, some people have seen this on, on social media. Uh, a post that's been going around that uh, later in May, coming up very soon in May, uh, that uh, Jupiter, Venus, and the Moon are going to line up and you're going to form a big happy face in the sky. And so if you look at the next slide here, this is what they say that it's going to look like. But next slide. No. No. <laughs> uh, this is totally wrong. Uh, these kinds of things really kind of drive us to be and Mary crazy uh, because there's lots of interesting events happening in the sky. <laughs> And some of these fake ones get more attention than the real ones, which is very frustrating. Uh, this is impossible. This is not going to happen, uh, at least not uh, any time this year, uh, because Jupiter and Saturn are in op completely opposite parts of the sky. Well, not Saturn, Jupiter, Venus. Right. Oh, sorry. Jupiter and Saturn, Venus. Venus and, and yeah. Jupiter. Uh, are going to be completely opposite sides of the parts of the sky. You can see Venus in the west after sunset. Mm -hmm. Well, where are these other planets? Well, let's go to the next slide and show you what's really happening here uh, in May. Uh, in May 12th through the 15th, you can watch the moon pass by the planets in the morning sky. And so we've got Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars uh, in the morning sky. Uh, let's say 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, you get up. Uh, you can see in the southern and southeastern sky, you got these planets. And on May 12th, uh, the moon will be near Jupiter. And then over the next couple of mornings, you'll see it pass by Saturn. And by the time you get to May 15th, uh, the moon is near Mars. And so that's a real planetary alignment that's happening this month. The smiley face, unfortunately, is not. <laughs> okay. Well, to add on to that, I remember back on... April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, there was this note going around saying that Saturn was going to transit the sun. And of course that can't happen for us because Saturn is an outer planet and to transit the sun, you have to go in between the mm -hmm. earth and the sun for, for us to see a transit. So some astronomers were sending that around as a joke. The only problem is when the public hears that, they're like, oh, is that really gonna happen? Because they don't realize that it's a joke for April Fool's Day. So there's, making a joke but then there's also bad science and so we yeah it's bad science really uh annoys us especially when we have like the mars hoax going around that mars is going to appear as as big and as bright as the full moon which if mars ever did do that in the real sky we would be in trouble because mars would be on a collision course with us so yeah. we are always very interested in making sure that we don't push any sort of misconceptions and we try to clear up some that might be circling around on social media or in the news too. Okay. okay. Um, we did have another question from uh, last time, if we want to take care of that uh, at this point. Um, we had a question about um, new, uh, new telescopes. What new telescopes are uh, being planned here? Uh, and uh, this is a question that uh, Mary from Scotch Plains had uh, asked. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at just a couple of examples. There are actually quite a few big telescopes that are being built right now. Uh, in Hawaii, we have the 30 meter telescope that is uh, uh, going to be starting construction soon, hopefully. Um, the, there's been a uh, controversy about the 30 meter telescope. It's being built on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, this, of course, is a sacred mountain to the Hawaiians, and so uh, uh, people are a little bit upset by this. Uh, though there are observatories already existing here, and it's a, kind of a big controversy, but hopefully everyone involved will 
uh, come to a, an agreement soon and they can actually start construction on this. And so this is a huge telescope, um, 30 uh, meters across. So you're talking uh, something that is, um, you know, almost uh, 30 yards across. So this is gigantic. The, the, it'll be the biggest thing that anyone has ever uh, built, the biggest uh, telescope that anyone has ever built. It has uh, a couple of different um, goals. And so we go to the next uh, slide here. Uh, certainly a big telescope like this is great for uh, looking at uh, galaxies. Oh, can we go back uh, to the 30 meter? Yeah. Uh, We've got uh, galaxies that we can explore. Uh, this huge telescope can collect a lot of light so we can look at galaxies. We can study more about the structure of the universe and uh, cosmology. Uh, because it is so large, it also be able to explore some of those exoplanets we were just talking about. Uh, we might actually be able to look at the atmospheres of some of these planets and the surfaces and try to figure out uh, whether or not any of these nearby ones are, are Earth-like. And of course, we can also look at stars and planet formation with a, a telescope this size. So uh, this is a, a kind of a big deal, you know, it's a, a pretty big uh, telescope. Uh, another telescope that I find really interesting that uh, is uh, underway right now and is uh, almost going, almost ready to start uh, uh, taking some test images, if I remember correctly, this year. Let's go on to the uh, next slide and uh, take a look at the Vera Rubin Observatory. And this is a very uh, unusual design telescope. It's actually not very large, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. This is an 8.4 meter telescope, about 330 inches across. And the uh, nice thing is that this is uh, the first major telescope named for a female astronomer. Uh, Vera Rubin is known for providing the best evidence that we have for dark matter. And a lot of people are still mad that she didn't get the Nobel Prize for it. And so uh, uh, this is nice that they honored her with the name of, after, with this observatory being named after her. Uh, it's a eight meter telescope that has a very wide field of view located in uh, Chile hopefully will be fully operational. I'll start taking test images I think very soon this year, fully operational by 2022. It'll be able to explore dark matter that Vera Rubin pioneered. Uh, also be able to look at asteroids and comets and supernova and be able to map, map the Milky Way. It's a very wide field. Three and a half degrees is gigantic. Most big telescopes have very small fields of view. There's a giant survey telescope and it will map the entire night sky, I think it's once every three days. There's going to be enormous amounts of data coming out of this uh, observatory. You go to the next slide, I believe um, I've got a picture here of the camera. This is the largest digital camera that uh, will be in existence in the world at this point. It's a 3.2 gigabyte camera. And so every picture, every single picture is going to be 3.2 gigabytes. And so they're going to uh, need about a hundred petabytes of storage for this uh, telescope, which is enormous, you know, just enormous amount of data coming out of this telescope. So lots of discoveries will start flowing from this, uh, hopefully in uh, 2022. Uh, to give you an idea of some of these big telescopes, let's go to this uh, last slide here and show you some of the mirrors of these telescopes. And off on the upper right-hand corner, you can see the 30 meter, you can see this giant uh, multi-part uh, mirror. Uh, down towards the, just to the, below the center, you'll see the Vera Rubin Observatory. You can see it's actually not that big of a, a telescope. Its advantage really is its wide field and the amount of images it's going to take is, uh, is its advantage. Very wild, wide field telescope. Right now, the biggest telescope in the world is uh, the Grand Telescopio. This is the uh, yellow one, uh, top center of the image here. Uh, this is the Grand Telescopio located in La Palma, the Canary Islands. Uh, so that's the biggest telescope in the world right now. It has been for a few years. And so look how much bigger the 30 meter is uh, to the, compared to that telescope. So this is a huge increase in size. And if you look at the lower uh, right-hand uh, section, you'll see a very large green colored mirror there. Uh, you can see that's even larger than the 30 meter. Uh, this is called the, uh, the European, the, the very large telescope. If I remember correctly, the Europeans are planning uh, this uh, telescope uh, or 
actually, no, not the VLT, it's the ELT, the extremely large telescope. That's supposed to be even larger than 30 meters. Uh, I'm not quite sure where, whether that's going to really happen where, where they are in the planning stages, but uh, that's another one that's uh, on, the, uh, on the drawing boards, at least. So some pretty big telescopes out there, uh, all looking out there at the universe. So pretty exciting. Uh, so, um, those are some of the questions that we've had in the past uh, few weeks. And so if there are other questions that our viewers have, uh, let's take care of some of those. Well, that'll be we have questions. They're actually really good. good. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to start, I'm going to go back and forth for all of my viewers. We're going to go back and forth between the Q&A that we have here in Zoom, as well as the Q&A that we have are the comment section in our Facebook page. So this first question comes from Bob. Um, and Bob wanted to know, um, Earth has a protective radiation belt. Do we uh, have a way to know which of these exoplanets have a protection radiation belt? And either, either Mary or uh, Kevin can take that question. Do I need to repeat? Okay, I'll take that one. That's all right. Yeah. So yeah, the Earth has a protective radiation belt. We call that the magnetosphere. And so scientists have developed a new method with, which allows them to estimate the magnetic field of a distant exoplanet. So they've been able to estimate the value of the magnetic uh, field of planet HD 209458b. So one of those crazy numbers that we get from the <laughs> IAU. Um, so there are ways to actually detect the magnetosphere around exoplanets, but do keep in mind these planets again are very far away, so we're getting very small signals from them. So you need to have very detailed uh, instrumentation looking for that kind of information. But it is possible to detect and to estimate the value of these magnetic fields around some of these exoplanets. Okay. And it wouldn't have to be a terrestrial exoplanet because Jupiter has a, man a magnetosphere as well. So even your gas giants orbiting other planets can have magnetospheres. Okay, awesome. Hopefully yeah. that helps you um, We have another question from Facebook Live. Um, this question, um, and it may be hard to quantify this answer for uh, both of you, but i give it a shot. So um, what are the most important discoveries in your field? That is one of our Facebook questions. So again, I know that might be it's <laughs> rather difficult. <laughs> But um, um, I, mean, well, I guess well, maybe we can maybe make the the question a little bit e e easier to answer. Perhaps is like, what's the most important discovery in our field recently? Okay. Uh, and I would say probably, I don't know if Mary would would agree, but I would say grav gravity waves. Oh like, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you know, that's part of uh, basically part of relativity. You know which, you know, relatively theory goes way back to the 20th century. And it's always been predicted that if relativity is a good working theory of how the universe works, we should be able to have, to be able, should be able to detect gravity waves. Uh, there should be a way of detecting the gravitational uh, field of big events that are happening in the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, interesting story, actually I don't know if, if uh, Mary knows this, this story, but uh, one of the people who pioneered in this field was actually from New Jersey. Uh, he was born in Patterson, a guy named Joe Weber. And he thought that he could detect uh, gravity waves by building a big massive metal cylinder. And uh, perhaps Mary, you've seen, have seen yeah, pictures the of these. They're called yeah. Weber, uh, Weber's, uh, uh, Weber cylinders uh, or Weber rods, I forget exactly the term. And he thought that the gravitational waves passing the earth could move this, you could detect it moving as these gravitational waves passed by us. Uh, and fortunately, some of his ideas were not so great, uh, but uh, uh, he didn't, I don't think he really understood how small of an effect that these gravitationals would have on something like that. And so uh, there was never developed into anything. They never really discovered gravitational waves, uh, but uh, it created a lot of interest. And eventually those instruments turned into very high precision uh, laser instruments. And so we have LIGO, uh, which is a laser interferometer gravity observatory. Uh, and they have stations, one is out on the Pacific Northwest, and I think one is down in Georgia. Louisiana. I think, no, Louisiana. Oh, Louisiana. Louisiana. I'm sorry, yes, Louisiana. Uh, so LIGO uh, is the, the laser-based machine that has been able to finally detect gravitational waves. And so 
this is a whole new area of astronomy, a whole new uh, area that we can explore in the universe by looking at these gravitational waves. And so that's pretty important uh, discovery. Um, Dark matter too is probably pretty important, you know, yeah. Well, one thing I want to add on to yes. what you're saying about gravity sure. waves, and am mm -hmm. I hearing myself echoing in someone else's? No, not anymore, okay. So one thing That's I wanted to add on is that those gravity waves Kevin was talking about, some of the ones that they detected were from the merger of black holes out in space. Yeah. So the, you have this huge right. event where you have these black sure. holes that are orbiting around each other and then they merge. The energy that is given off through that merging causes those waves through uh, space-time, basically what we're seeing, those gravity waves moving through space. And so, as Kevin said, it does take a very large and very powerful event to create these gravity waves. But for us to detect them, you do have to have very, very uh, specifically honed detectors to focus in on that kind of energy coming from outer space. Okay. Awesome. So it looks like we have a new branch of uh, astronomy for our young astronomers. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, cultivate. Um, I love that. Um, so this next question comes from uh, one of our viewers from Zoom. Um, Francis wants to know, so what is intelligent life and how is it different from just life? Well, I, certainly I think that could be is. subjective. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Definitely subjective. <laughs> Again, I was like, I, yeah. <laughs> it's one yeah. of those like, uh, at, at a basic level, just like we have here on Earth, there's varying levels of intelligence. You know, you've got plants, uh, which, you know, respond to music, apparently, you know, uh, uh, but there, you know, there's uh, much, there's microscopic life. Uh, so, you know, some of these habitable worlds that we've mentioned uh, today, well, yeah, you may not find intelligent life, but you might find some kind of bacterial life. Find some, kind of, find some kind of plant life uh, that it exists on these other habitable worlds. There's no reason why you can't have a plant world. <laughs> the plants have the whole place to oh, themselves. You know? yeah. So vegetarian planets, you know, <laughs> that's a possibility, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just mentioned that uh, one of the uh, planets uh, could be a water world. So you could have a planet ruled by dolphins, you know, or something similar to that, you know, or whales or something like that. You know, they're pretty, actually pretty darn intelligent. We're not necessarily the only intelligent life on this, on this, our own planet. Right? Maybe yeah. Other ones. So, yeah, it is kind of a subjective question, but yeah, there's certainly a lot of levels of intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about the different forms of animal life we have on this planet, you can say that ants are intelligent because they work in a community to yeah. help the community to create their homes, to get the food. Mm -hmm. Same thing with bees. Right. They work in colonies and they work together. So there's an intelligence there. If you want to go one step further, perhaps uh, animals that have learned to use tools like the great apes, how they use a stick to stick it into a termite mound and then eat the, eat the termites off the stick. So learning how to use tools is another level of intelligence. And then as we go forward and forward talking about how developed that intelligence becomes when you develop technologies like we're using today or spacefaring technologies, you, your level of intelligence is going to increase. Hopefully, the species won't destroy itself, you know, as we get to those <laughs> levels. But that's one of the reasons why that we have what's called the Drake equation as to how many planets in our galaxy could possibly harbor life and how many of those could form intelligent life and how many of those would live beyond their infancy and not destroy themselves to become face, say, uh, spacefaring and so, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so you talk about these varying degrees of intelligence compared to just life like bacteria and amoeba where you don't really see um, a community working together for a common goal. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of thinking about life versus intelligent life. Okay. Um, yeah. I love the way you all answered that because um, that was a tricky one. Um, <laughs> so we have another one coming in from Facebook um, in the comments. Um, so this question is sort of a two part question. Um, so do exoplanets have a gas atmosphere? Question part half of the question. And then same air pressure as Earth. So uh, I'm guessing they want to know, you know, the exoplanets that uh, we discuss. Um, do they have a, a gas? Are they all gas atmospheres, and, and do would they have the same pressure, air pressure, as Earth, planet Earth? I suppose if you, you know, if you look at our own solar system, uh, there's a wide variety, and that's uh, probably the case for all of these exoplanets. Uh, yeah, you might find. Um, planets that have very, very thick uh, gaseous atmospheres. You might find some 
that have none at all, especially those planets that are located really close to their suns, their atmospheres have probably been stripped off. Uh, you have gas giants, they have these enormous hydrogen helium atmospheres, you know, so uh, definitely a, a wide range. And uh, for uh, part two of the question in terms of air pressure similar to the Earth, uh, well, we only need to look at our own inner solar system. You've got Venus, which the pressure is very high. Um, is it 100 atmospheres, Mary? Uh, 100 times somewhere the pressure? Somewhere around there. Yeah, somewhere around, around 100, 100 atmospheres at the, at the surface. So not only will Venus burn you up, it'll, it'll crush you as well. Uh, <laughs> so it's a pretty, pretty unpleasant place. Uh, but then you go out to Mars, and the pressure is a fraction of what mm -hmm. there, there is an atmosphere, carbon dioxide atmosphere, that is a fraction of the pressure here uh, on Earth. And so even though we like to think of Mars as an Earth-like planet or most Earth-like planet, you still need a spacesuit to walk on the surface because uh, the pressure is so low. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to move right along here. We're running out of time, so I'm going to try to get it. as many of your questions in, guys. Sure. So you, you and at home, if we don't get to your questions via the comments um, on Facebook, or if we don't get your, to your questions here in our Q&A section, we will definitely answer them on the next episode. Um, I have another question from Francis. Um, have we discovered moons from any exoplanets? Ooh, yes, we have. Uh, there's... Uh, at least one, there might be even two, I'm not quite sure, I've, I've, I've lost track, but uh, yeah, yeah, we've uh, started to discover exomoons. And so hopefully when some of these bigger telescopes are, are built and come online, uh, you've got the, uh, the 30 meters telescope is still a few, quite a few years away, they haven't started construction, uh, but the James Webb Space Telescope hopefully will be flying in about a year or so, keep our fingers crossed, it's been delayed <laughs> quite a bit, uh, so, but it's a big space telescope, the infrared uh, telescope, so that should be able to show us quite a bit uh, about extrasolar planets, and so uh, hopefully they'll be finding moons as well. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have another one um, from Facebook. Uh, this question is, uh, what are the criteria for calling something an exoplanet? What would you need to classify it as an exoplanet? Uh, it has to orbit hmm. around a, sun, a star that is not our sun. So it has to be outside of our own solar system for number one. That's probably the most important thing. Exoplanets can be, you know, Jupiter kind planets. They can be terrestrial like the Earth. They could be like Venus or Mercury or Mars. Uh, you can have a, a very different kind of exoplanet. You could have, like Kevin was saying before in the presentation, you could have diamonds on the surface because of how close it is to its parent star and the fact that there's a lot of carbon on that planet. But uh, to be an exoplanet, you have to be orbiting around a star that is outside of our own solar system. That's what the whole term exo means, to be outside of our own solar system. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, yeah. we're also talking about... Um objects that are in terms of mass or somewhere between Mercury and many Jupiters, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So it's a big range of sizes. We don't really have a, a, a perfectly set uh, definition of what is and what is not an exoplanet at this point, a rough idea, but because we just don't know enough, especially about the smaller objects uh, our tele are out of reach of our current telescopes. So hopefully as bigger telescopes come online, we'll, we'll learn more about these solar systems and be able to kind of figure out, well, what's a planet and what's not. And we can okay. refine and we can re definitions. We can readdress Pluto at that point yes. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. as our time is winding down, um, I do want to get to uh, one more question here in sure. our uh, comment section, our Q&A section. And again, we do have a lot of questions we didn't get to, so we do see those okay. Um, and we will get to those in the next episode. Uh, so this next question is from one of our attendees here in the Zoom. Um, they wanted to know, where is the world's largest digital camera located? Well, I, I, as I mentioned, it will be the, the, the Vera Rubin uh, telescope this year will take over that title. If I remember correctly, I think the Subaru telescope, uh, the Japanese Subaru telescope is also located in Hawaii. Uh, currently has the title. I don't remember off the top of my head what the size is, but if you uh, search for Subaru telescope, uh, that should come up and you can see how big it is. It's, it's pretty enormous, you know, a couple of gigabytes in size. Okay, um, I'm, and I have a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna try to, because I want to squeeze in as many questions as possible, because uh, you all are sending us some really good ones. So thank you for the participation, we love it. Um, so I have another question, um, and this one is uh, from our Facebook live uh, feed. Um, they want to know, um, how do 
how do you know that uh, there's water on uh, Europa? How do you how do you all know that um, for certain? Mm. Um, well, um, you know, we've we've sent spacecraft. You know, we've got the Voyager spacecraft was the the sp spacecraft that sort of discovered that. Uh, so the Voyager spacecraft, the Galileo spacecraft that orbited Jupiter for many years, uh, and uh, just from the uh, I don't remember the specifics, but just from the density of the material, I mean, we got some very close passes to that moon, and just like, looking at the surface, you can see the icy surface is very obvious, uh, and we have the kind of chemical signatures of what's on the surface of that moon, and uh, uh, from the gravitational uh, pole of, of Jupiter. We know that the uh, ice can't really exist at those temperatures and pressures, so the ice must be in the form of water. And that's why you can see the cracks. The whole surface is cracked because the, you know, just like a pond, you know, that uh, where you know, it gets a little bit warm and the ice starts to crack, you know, that's the same kind of thing going on. And so we can see that. And as I said, hopefully you know, the Europa Clipper spacecraft will go visit there. We'll have an orbiter and maybe eventually a lander and uh, take some samples or land in those cracks and or try to find a spot in those cracks where the ice is thin and try to dig down in there. See what we can find. All right. Um, we have another question here um, in our uh, Q&A uh, on Zoom. And this question is from, um, uh, well, specifically speaking to the black holes. So uh, how are black holes detected? And what do we know about them? Now, I know you maybe spoke to this a little bit in previous uh, asking astronomers. So, um, you know, by all means, continue. Go, you know, go ahead and uh, relate the answer to that. Okay. Well, one way that we can detect black holes is by looking for the accretion disk that exists around black holes that have material falling towards the event horizon itself. What happens is it can tear apart stars, it can tear apart planets, and that material forms into a disk around the black hole where your event horizon is. That's your point of no return. Once you go beyond that, you can't escape because you have to travel faster than the speed of light. So we have these very bright accretion disks that can form around the black holes, which can help us detect them. But also, if it doesn't have an accretion disk, we can see how the black hole affects the area around it. So if you see a star that looks like it's orbiting around a, an empty area of space, well, that star has to be orbiting around something. It wouldn't just be orbiting in a circle on its own. It has to be affected by something else. So watching how stars are moving in their orbits, if they seem like they're orbiting around some invisible object, there may be a black hole there. So that's one way of sort of inadvertently detecting them. Since black holes by themselves are not something that we can see because they don't give off energy themselves, we have to see how they affect the space around them in that way. But then also, as we were talking about gravity waves and stuff, if you have two black holes interacting, you can have those gravitational waves moving through space. And that's another way of being able to detect them too. Yeah. And there's a accretion disk that Mary uh, described as that material is falling into the black hole. It's moving so fast, it gives off x-rays. Again, mm -hmm. look for those x-rays. And uh, that's uh, one way of finding them. Fortunately for us, uh, black holes are sloppy eaters, and we can see all this radiation <laughs> pouring out of them. Some, uh, if, they're, if they happen to be eating at the time, you can see radiation pouring out of them. Even though light can escape from them, you still see radiation coming from them. Okay, cool. Um, this question here is uh, from Facebook, um, and I'm very curious about this as well, because I've never heard of this before. So is there such a thing as a sun rainbow? Have you ever... Well, Sun, well, rainbows there are, there across are halos are all, and there are uh, sun dogs, um, but a sun rainbow? I mean, well, definitely oh, rainbows well, are caused by the sun. Yeah, that all rainbows are sun rainbows to a certain yeah. extent, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but perhaps, you know, uh, um, and I forget exactly what they're, what they're called, but sometimes you can see uh, when you're in air, an airplane, sometimes you can see rainbow effects uh, up high in the atmosphere. Uh, and halos around the sun and the, and the moon can sometimes have a kind of a color to them that kind of look a little bit like a rainbow. And that's all effects of moisture and ice crystals in the atmosphere, you know. Okay. So those are definitely some pretty interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Especially the sun dogs that Mary mentioned. Those yeah. are usually appear, at, usually at sunset on either side, you get these little tiny little streaks of rainbows on either side of the sun. And those are just called sun dogs because they follow the sun. Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Like a dog following you. <laughs> you know. 
Well, I'm gonna knock out these last two questions in our uh, Q&A feed. And then um, there's like maybe two more questions here from Facebook Live um, before we try to wrap everything up. Um, we have like a, a few minutes, so I think we can squeeze them in. So I'm gonna just uh, kind of jumble these last two questions in our Q&A together, um, since they're very short. Uh, so one is from Elena and one is from one of our anonymous attendees in the session. Um, how do exoplanets get named? And the second part of that would be, uh, is warp speed possible? So I'm very curious about the Star Trek question because I'm, I'm low-key a nerd in that regard because I would like, is warp speed ever a thing that we can make? Um, so yeah, so I guess uh, how do exoplanets get named might be the first one you want to tackle and then the warp speed question next. Right. Well, as Kevin mentioned in the presentation today, um, exoplanets tend to originally get named by using the name of the star that they're orbiting around and then you add a lowercase letter after that. So A would be the first one you find around that star, B would be the second, C would be the third, and so on and so forth. So like with the Trappist system, you have Trappist 1A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I think all the way out to H? Wait, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G, to G. G so, that's, right, that's yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so basically to begin to name the way the IAU, the, Interna the International Astronomical Union names them is you start with this, the star name first and then you give it a designation for the planet. You give it a lowercase letter after that to associate it with the star that it was found around. But as Kevin showed in the presentation, now they're starting to come up with more um, more creative names and they're reaching out to the public to say help us to name yeah. this new exoplanet. So some of them are getting more creative names rather than like HD 2645 plus <laughs> yeah, 384, plus two. <laughs> which is almost <laughs> impossible to remember, but yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. But let's, let's just call it, you know, um, um, Susan for now. You know, we'll, we'll call it Susan and then, you know, the, the, uh, the planet can be called uh, Evangeline or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, I think uh, the the number uh, the names that I showed uh, were from a contest that the IAU had about five years ago, and so it was nice to get some public uh, input from all over the world, and they had thousands and thousands of suggestions, and uh, hopefully they'll they'll do that again because they got another four thousand plants to go uh, that that uh, might need names, you know. So, we're gonna need some help. Yeah, <laughs> you need some help. Yeah. <laughs> so tackling my favorite part of this question: so is warp speed possible? or do we think that warp speed is, will be a thing? I think theoretically it can be, but instead of going faster than the speed of light, it's more of warping space time to travel from one point to another. Um, so it depends upon if we can develop the technology for it to be a reality in our lives. Yeah. But um, yeah, so instead of trying to go faster than the speed of light, there may be some other technology where we can actually warp space time to go from one point to another much faster than if you were to travel, say, in a linear line in okay. that way. Um, and the last one that just popped up here on this uh, feed is, uh, is there an observatory near New Jersey um, that allows public to visit? I mean, that's a great question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, there are. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, sure, and there's, uh, and not just observatories, there are uh, astronomy clubs uh, as well. You know, it's the telescope is the important part, not the, the observatory itself. And so you have a lot of astronomy clubs around uh, around New Jersey, and uh, there are a couple of observatories that are open to the public. Uh, a couple of state parks have them, and uh, Rutgers has an observatory. Some of the universities have them. Uh, so there are uh, some out there. Obviously, right now, all of those are, are closed, but uh, uh, hopefully as uh, time goes on, we'll be reopening soon. Okay. <laughs> now this one is from Facebook. So uh, again, um, I think we have like maybe two left on. Well, really, this is the last one on Facebook. So um, okay. we're good on time. Um, so with that, um, this one comes from, um, I believe uh, Grizel uh, Grizelle, and I might be mispronouncing your name. I'm so sorry. Um, the question is, uh, I once hear, uh, once heard that if one twin went to space and spent years in space, that the person would age slower than the twin that remained on Earth. Is that true? Um, does space travel and being in space for a long term affect uh, the aging process um, in, a, in an individual? Uh, oh, uh, called, it's called the twin effect uh, or twin paradox uh, sometimes. And uh, so uh, that is possible but only if you're traveling near the speed of light. As we know, as you increase your speed, as you get up towards the speed of light, time actually slows down. It's a really bizarre thing, but it's uh, a real effect. And, um, 
we've actually can measure it right here here on Earth. Uh, but yeah, your time actually slows down for the traveler. So if you have twins, one who's here on Earth and the other one who's uh, on a Star, Star Trek-like ship that's going warp speed, uh, they go out, they come back, and uh, time has moved slower for them. So the twin on Earth is actually older. Oh, wow. age more slowly because the time is passing for you much more slowly so now that's a, <laughs> true <laughs> like, i would be like, like that that sounds like another interesting plot like uh, they that's the part that we've never they've never explored in that series the real science behind what, what you know, light speed would mean for mm -hmm. family members that were left behind mm -hmm. on their home so yep. um to 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 be out there sure. traveling the galaxy and to come back and your kids are all grown like that might um you know be a, be, be something worth uh, digging into um there's a, there's a fantastic uh, science fiction novel called forever war by joe haldeman that's really interesting okay. uh it plays into the plot a big part in the plot does it so it touches on that a little bit uh, yeah now, now i have some some uh, quarantine reading to do yeah um, there you go <laughs> <laughs> as we wrap up um i just want to make sure that i shout you all out as well because we have a lot of people just who didn't want to have a question they just wanted to say thank you um so Bob, thank you for, for joining us yeah they were like very much enjoyed this they they Great. said thank you thank you thank you um they thought it was really cool um so for all of you viewing us at home as we wrap up I do want to touch on a couple of things. We do have a, this isn't our only stop. So there are multiple programs that we have throughout the week. Um, the New York Museum of Art, we are a global institution. So we are always connecting with other galleries, other museums, and there's always a plethora of things to do. Speaking of plethora of things to do, this week alone, we have Lunch and Learn, which is happening this Thursday. We're going to be sitting down with artist Kinsis Armstead. And we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with them um, about a couple of a variety of things. Um, and I also want to highlight that uh, Friday, I, I can't forget Friday. Friday, Friday is the launch of my show. So I'm very excited. Yeah. So, yeah, so, <laughs> we did a test run with them, my, mm -hmm. my colleagues and it was, it was fun. We had an amazing time. So we can't wait uh, to share with you all our happy hour. So uh, Friday's tune into happy hour. We know that um, the bars may be closed, but hey, the museum, the Newark Museum, we are open. So we want to make sure that you get your cocktails ready, get your uh, playlist ready. Again, if you're not, uh, or don't have a Spotify account, go ahead and log in and create a Spotify account. We have a cool curated playlist for you, along with we'll be mixing, uh, I believe it's Tequila Sunrise on uh, our happy hour this uh, episode. So so details are on our Facebook page for that. And I can't close out without mentioning Saturday for our parents, especially if you have little ones. We have our uh, Storytime Live. Um, so you can register for that mm -hmm. as well on Facebook. Um, so again, all of these events are posted on our event page on Facebook. Um, so you can register, sign in, get the login information so that you can be here and um, kind of rock out with us for the rest of the week. Like I said, we're not going to leave you. We are here in this with you. We're all in this together. Um, and uh, we want you to know that the New York Museum of Art is your home away from home, even for those who are joining us um, who do not live in the state of New York and New Jersey. Uh, we're, we're glad that you decided to stay with us for today. Um, and we hope to see you throughout. So uh, Daryl Dwayne, wrapping, signing off. Mary, uh, Kevin, do you have any closing words or closing uh, statements? Oh, join us uh, Join us next time. Remember, next Ask, Ask an Astronomer, we have a guest speaker, uh, Shauna Edison from the Air and Space Museum is gonna talk about the sun and a new solar probe that is being sent by NASA. So that's going to be awesome. cool. That's yeah. May 19th, by the way. So in case you missed that date earlier, May 19th, make sure you right. tune in for May our 19th. next time. We are, again, glad you joined us. And that's us signing off. Thank you so Great. much, Bo. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Yeah, happy hour. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Friday. <laughs>